Andrew, do you want to um, do your thing? Yeah, sure. I, I, it's just a short presentation, so I'll, um, I'll do that. Um, let's see how I do it. You think I'd be well practiced at how to use Zoom by now? I sort of am. Can you see a slideshow or just my emails? Just got a black screen at the moment. Oh, it's coming. It's yes. coming, yes. Excellent. Yeah, my upload speeds are poor, so I'll apologize in advance because it's uh, it, it, it's a bit slow, my internet. So fingers crossed we'll get through it without, uh, without me freezing or getting booted off the internet. Um, so we're just going to have a little kind of chat about co-fermentation and how you can blend in yeast, bacteria, uh, yeast and bacteria to get different results. Um, so we've just got a few slides. Um, so I, it's, it's interesting to think about yeast and, and, and the kind of cultures that we use today, because, you know, if you think back, yeast was uh, almost responsible for, for civilization as we know it today. You know, people settled when they realized that they could make uh, crops, they could grow crops, and from those they could uh, make beer. But they didn't have any understanding of what they were doing. They didn't understand how, how yeast worked. Um, they just knew that if they took some grain and they got it wet or they, you know, treated it in the same way as they did last time, they would get uh, an alcoholic product at the end of it, which they could drink safely, but also would have some sort of intoxicating effect. So, you know, it was a kind of a mixture of, of mystery and, and magic. You know, how does this happen? We don't know, but it always does it when we do it the same way. So you end up with that tradition coming as well. Um, and that's where you saw things like kvik rings and you saw like the same stick being used to stir the brew, which would give you this, this good beer at the end of the day. And these say these these weren't pure cultures, you know, these were all mixed strains uh, and they probably contained bacteria as well. So, you know, originally brewing was uh, always done in, in, in the way that we're going to talk about today using co-fermentation. Um, and it's only in, in more recent times that that's changed. Um, so, you know, over the years, brewers have unwittingly just domesticated these strains. So uh, everything that you see in brewing yeast today, so good attenuation characteristics, good flocculation characteristics, uh, alcohol tolerance, all things that we've slowly selected for over the years. Um, yeast in the wild environment isn't like that. You know, if, if you ever do any yeast wrangling, it's actually pretty rare to find something that will uh, happily ferment work sugars. So maltose and maltotriers aren't easily assimilated by uh, wild yeast. Um, so over those years, we've selected for these yeasts that do do this and they do it well. And that was pretty much down to people saying this beer is good and then taking either the, the cake, if we talked about, or, or the implements used for that brew and using them to create the next one um, to create a consistent product over time. Um, that's, you know, where things like Kvike rings came from. But this all changed and actually it's only changed quite recently. So you have a guy called Louis Pasteur, who's a, a famous uh, microbiologist, French microbiologist, who uh, wasn't well known for um, being a particularly ethical bloke. He uh, developed several vaccines by testing them on, on children <laughs> and other things. He was, wasn't no, a very nice chap, um, but he lived in a very nice village in, uh, in France, which I've actually visited. Um, and he discovered also that yeast was a, a microorganism and the causative agent of alcoholic fermentation. And finally, you had a guy called Emil Christian Hansen who kind of developed on this work and uh, he developed a method for creating a pure culture of yeast. So he looked down a microscope and he said, OK, I can choose this and I can create a, a single culture of yeast. So it's going to be just this one strain. It's not going to be a, a mixture of strains that we've used in the past. Uh, and not only did he sell that method, so people around the world started using this method to create single strain cultures. He also sold the yeast um, all over Europe. So he sent it to many, many different breweries, which is one of the reasons that you have um, such similar uh, lager strains. So most of the lager strains out there are, are actually two different types and there might be slight variations between the two, but they really all are descended from two different types of yeast. Um, so there just isn't very much variation. There's not much diversity in lager strains. And, and that's kind of similarly uh, found in ale strains as well. So there's an awful lot of different ale strains that you could buy, but actually if you look at the genetic differences between them, they're actually quite similar. Um, and they're all pure cultures. Uh, and is there anything out there at the moment or the, today which kind of retains that mixed culture, that phenomenon in the past but before it uh, became modernized and all became single strains? And the answer is uh, yes. And uh, that's the Kvike strains that have been talked about uh, so much over the last few years. Um, this is just an example of some Kvike strains that we took into uh, Lalamand and, and, and 
purified um, for the different cultures within, within them. And you can see that these um, spike strains, uh, as they're still used in Norway, are actually a mixture of uh, yeast and bacteria. And this would have been very much like how uh, brewing yeast would have been in, in Europe and, and in the UK uh, before uh, Christian Hansen came along and, and made them pure cultures. So um, it's interesting to see that that has uh, been retained. It's a bit of a shame that we don't have uh, that diversity uh, in, in the strains that we see in, in use in the UK today. You know, there's a few kind of breweries that you can look at that probably still have a degree of, of mixed cultures that have been using their strains for a very long time. Um, one of those is close to me, and that, that's Harvey's of Lewis, um, who use a, a mixed culture, um, which has been maintained, I think, now for about 50 years. Um, so it's not the original, but it's been around for a long time, and it's uh, they repitch from one batch to the next, and they always use the same yeast. Um, and inevitably, there are several different strains found within it. So if this is something that we want to try and do uh, deliberately, that, why would you do this? What would be the reason? You know, why, why would you want to blend different yeasts and, and what might the results be? Um, so there's a few different things that uh, we've looked at. Um, alcohol tolerance would be one. Um, pH tolerance, uh, some strains are quite sensitive to low pHs particularly. Um, so that's a, a reason that you might do it. Um, another one would be to look at flocculation. So you might have a strain that uh, tastes really good, um, but doesn't flocculate particularly well. I'm thinking here, maybe our Windsor strain, um, which has very nice flavor to it, but doesn't really like to drop out. Uh, and then attenuation as well. So there's many brewing strains out there that don't ferment malted trios. Um, they create really nice flavors. Um, they might produce quite a lot of citrus flavors, but they don't then attenuate very well. So you might see somewhere in the 60s instead of the 70s or the low 80s. Uh, and maybe you can add a strain in at the start of fermentation with that strain to increase the attenuation, or maybe you could add it later on to increase attenuation. Uh, cost management is another one. It's probably less of a less, less of a concern at the homebrew scale, but certainly something that we maybe shouldn't ignore. Um, there are strains out there which are cheaper, and uh, you could use them in collaboration with a more expensive strain uh, and get similar results. And there's uh, to prevent or save stock fermentation. So we've already seen the uh, speaking today. There's there's been a few people that have had problems with uh, fermentations that are stuck or they've slowed, uh, and adding another yeast into the equation can actually save those. And then finally, we've got the point of uh, satisfying continuous demand. Uh, for innovative products so um, people are all about hops today so we've got some very interesting strains that are quite hoppy you know the verdant produces really hoppy flavors uh, but could you blend that with another strain to get a, an even more interesting result so there's a few things you may need to know before you start um, blending yeasts because it's it's not necessarily as simple as just adding you know two yeasts at the same time and, and seeing what happens. Um, some yeast strains have uh, longer lag phases than others. So if you add one at the start that's really, really slow and another that's really, really fast, it could easily take off uh, and outcompete that strain that you've added at the start. And then you don't get any from anything from that strain. So there's no reason to do it. Um, fermentation substrates, so that's just the sugars that you've got present within the wort. So classically in a brewer's wort, you've got uh, Super, uh, sorry, sucrose, let's talk about wine now. Maltose, glucose, and maltotriose so are your main fermentable sugars within a brewer's wort. And most yeast strains, most brewing yeast strains, will ferment all three of those, but not all of them will. So it's worth taking that into account. Um, you know, we've got quite a few strains within our catalogue that don't ferment maltotriose so that actually leave quite a lot of, um, of uh, sugar behind. And there's some even more specialist strains that we'll look at later. So some of your wine strains will actually only ferment glucose, but they might actually give you quite a nice flavor. So understanding what that yeast can ferment uh, and whether you'd need to add something else in at the same time uh, to get full, full fermentation and full attenuation. Uh, flavor compounds, as you know, some yeasts are much more aromatic than others. Um, they may also be slower um, or they might produce too much of one particular compound. So can you add two yeasts at the same time that will give you a different flavor or they might prevent one of them predominating. That's, that's uh, something you could do. Um, killer factor is something that you probably won't be uh, very familiar with because most brewing yeasts don't produce killer factors. But if you're doing any co-fermentation with um, wine yeasts uh, or sometimes with saison yeasts, they can be killer positive. So they actually produce a competition factor that will prevent uh, brewing yeast from growing as uh, effectively as they should. And they can give you stunted fermentation. So that's something to bear in mind. And then I've got this final one in red because it's something that's uh, been brought up with me quite a lot recently um, in, with commercial breweries. And that's viable cell concentration. So that's talking about the, um, the viable cells in a dry yeast. Um, so if you're adding two dry yeast at the same time, they might have different viable cell concentrations. And therefore, if you're adding 
50-50 by weight, you're actually not adding 50-50 by viable cells, um, which can give you problems in fermentation. Um, I'll come on to that, but there's a particular example, which would be the Windsor strain that we use, uh, plus the New England strain that we produce. Um, the Windsor has a much higher viable cell concentration than the New England, and if you add them together at 50-50, you quite often see problems with poor attenuation. Uh, finally, some other things that you might consider. Um, Repitching is a bit tricky with a uh, mixed culture because you don't know how the blend is going to be after fermentation. So you're going to see changes. It's not to say that you can't do it, but it might not give you that same result as you, as you had the first time around. Um, it can be hard to predict the results. And then finally, sequential inoculation. I've kind of built on that a little bit already with the lag phase, but if you've got a strain that is particularly slow, you might add that second strain, that co-fermenting strain at a later point to give that first strain time to, um, to take off. And that would be called sequential inoculation. Um, that's quite important as well if you're using uh, bacteria. So this is just to give you an idea of uh, the strains that we have that are poor attenuators, so the winds of the London and the CBC1, you know, particularly the winds are in London, they produce some really nice flavours, but they do stop quite high. Um, so you're probably talking about a 65% sort of attenuation. Um, also the CBC1, all right, that's genetically a champagne yeast, but some people do use it for primary fermentation. Um, often it's quoted as a good thing to use for imperial stouts. Uh, not actually the case because it has poor attenuation. So people say you can finish an imperial stout using a CBC1 yeast, and that, that just doesn't work because they don't ferment more citrus. Um, what could you do about that? You could add a yeast that does. Um, so we've put down here BOI 97 non Nottingham. Of the two, I'd probably use Nottingham just because it's quite a virulent strain. You know, it will bash through most things. It's quite temperature tolerant and it's quite fast. So that's probably the one that I would use to increase your uh, attenuation if you're using strains that are, are poorly attenuated. Um, obviously, the Nottingham is quite uh, flavour neutral and it's also quite aggressive, so I might not necessarily add these at the same time. I might wait until that Windsor or that London has had a chance to produce some of those fruity esters that they do produce, and then I'd add the Nottingham slightly later on. Uh, fermentation performance. So you've got uh, two suggestions here. This is the Windsor and the New England, so this can increase your haziness. So actually, it, it, it's often said that New England isn't hazy enough, and that, that's true. It doesn't drop very well, but the Windsor is actually very poorly flocculating. Um, and that's possibly due to the fact that it doesn't uh, ferment mosotrose because that actually acts as a, a compound that will prevent flocculation. So you could add some Windsor into that fermentation uh, just to provide a bit more haziness in the final beer. It's also a bit more of a rapid fermenter, a fermenter than New England. The New England can be quite slow. Um, so you could use that Windsor there just to increase the speed of that fermentation. Uh, flavor profile wise, they're actually quite similar to the Windsor in the New England. They actually produce quite an, a similar flavor. It's just that the attenuation is quite, uh, quite different. Uh, then if you wanted to use Windsor, but you also wanted it to sediment better, you can actually use two yeasts at once to improve uh, flocculation performance. So uh, the Windsor is quite a poor flocculator, as we've already mentioned, but the Nostrum is actually a very good flocculator. And if you add them together, you can benefit from the flavour of the Windsor, but it will actually uh, drop better with the Nostrum there in solution. Cost saving. This, this is something I, I actually put in for uh, commercial breweries, but... Um, we actually produce a, an, a line of yeast called the essential line for commercial breweries, and it's slightly cheaper. Um, and if you were using a very expensive strain and you were cost sensitive, uh, you could add that cheaper strain at the same time as New England. And it's quite a neutral fermenter. Um, so you'd still get that benefit of the flavor of the New England, but you'd have slightly cheaper yeast overall. Similarly, uh, lager strains are quite expensive because you have to use them at quite high pitch rates um, because of the cold temperatures, but also they're quite hard to grow. Um, but Nottingham is a very cold tolerant strain. Um, so Nottingham will actually ferment down to about 10 degrees. So if you wanted to do a lager, but you wanted to decrease the, loss, the cost of your lager, you could actually use Nottingham at the same time. Uh, and it would still ferment at 10 degrees, uh, albeit you'd have to use slightly more of it, uh, but it would reduce your cost overall for the use for that brew. Uh, also using sour pitch, so this is a, a bacteria that we produce, it's a lactobacillus, um, and it's commonly used for kettle souring, but you can actually use it in fermentation, so you could use it in co-fermentation, along with various strains to create uh, sour styles, you might have sour American ale or a slightly sour wheat beer or a sour saison, um, but this is something that you have to consider uh, co-inoculation co co for, so sequential inoculation for, and that's because the sour pitch produces lactic acid but it produces it from glucose um, which is there in your uh, in your brewer's water but at quite uh, low concentration and if you were to add both the yeast and the bacteria at the same time at the start of fermentation the yeast would outcompete that bacteria 
uh, for the glucose and therefore you wouldn't really see any souring. So the idea would be to add your sour pitch for maybe 24 hours prior to adding your brewer's yeast uh, and then you would see souring and then fermentation. There's just a few commercial examples of things that people have done out there. So this is a, a brew that's been produced by La Parata Brewery in Spain. Uh, it's called Liquid Fear, uh, and they used a combination of the New England and the BRY97. Now, as I've said before, um, viable cell count comes into play here. So the New England, although it says it's 50%, it's actually lower than 50% because there's more viable cells in the BRY97. Um, so they've got some NEPA flavors in there, um, but they've got the fermentation performance of the BRY97. There's another brew here, I can't actually pronounce this, I'm not even going to try it, I don't think it's worth my while, it's got an X in it, uh, but they use the saison yeast and the, wild, uh, and the wild brew sour pitch to produce a, a, a Berliner Weiss at 4%, it's kind of a, a low ABV kind of sour Berliner Weiss, and they would have added that sour pitch at the start, uh, and then they would have waited and they would have used the, uh, the saison as well. Something I've forgotten to, to mention, and it's quite important here, is you can't use hops in these fermentations because the sour pitch is very, very sensitive to hops. Um, alpha acids kill it, basically. Uh, and it was designed in that way because it was very safe to handle in the brewery. Uh, but it means that you can't add hops to these fermentations at the start. You would need to dry hop them at the end uh, and then either adjust the bitterness with, you can use some uh, bitterness extract that you can get, or you can leave it as just a very uh, low bitterness brew, just taking the bitterness from the dry hops. Then again, we've got uh, wine co-fermentation. So this is a beer done by Don Zoko Brewery in the UK, and they used uh, one of our wine yeast, 71B in Bell Saison uh, in primary fermentation. And this again was sequential inoculation. Um, so 71B is quite a slow strain. Uh, it doesn't ferment some of your, your wort sugars, so it's best to add it at the start, and then you add the Bell Saison uh, later on. And that Bell Saison is obviously a diastatic yeast as well, so it ferments right out and it gives you a very dry beer. But you have a really interesting fruity character from, from the wine yeast. So you, looking beyond brewing yeast, so obviously we're quite uh, familiar with how brewing yeast uh, work and, 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 and what we could use them for, but there are quite a lot of different wine yeasts out there which are uh, used uh, for, for, for wine and they, they quite often use sequential oculation in, in, in wine yeast. So Torrioros Folio yeast and Cudurvese yeasts are quite often added at the start of fermentation to give you a really interesting kind of fruity ester hit before you go in with a more standard wine yeast that does the bulk of the alcoholic fermentation. And then uh, also Lahantia species, so they can produce lactic acid as they ferment. So they can actually drop the pH of your um, of your wine must, or they might uh, convert some of your um, wine sugars, the malic acid, into into lactic acid, and they'll give you a softer acidity. Um, so that's quite commonly done in wine, but there's no reason that you can't extend that to, to brewer's yeast as well. Uh, and then wild yeast, including brett, so you can use those in co-fermentation. If you use them at the end, you can get some really interesting fruity esters, and they're quite slow. They describe them as fastidious, so you can add your brett strains, but don't expect to have a quick fermentation. These are things that you want to leave to store for quite a long time to get the benefit of the really fruity flavours that they can produce. So again, this is just a final slide giving you some really interesting combinations that you, you could try. Um, of these, I think my favourite is probably the Abbey and Belle Saison, which gives you a really interesting kind of mixed ferment, kind of Belgian sour kind of thing going on. Um, it's really kind of interesting. Um, but then the BOI and the sour pitch at the same time give you a really nice kind of American sour ale. So that's quite a fun one as well. So it, it's really good. You know, it's kind of like an artist's palette. You've got all these different strains that you can take and you could combine the two to produce really interesting flavours. So um, don't, don't just take our recommendations. I think it's worth looking at the strains that we produce and just saying, you know, I could use this with this to produce a, a really interesting result. Yeah, yeah just to sum it up, you know, that, that's something that's been done by brewers for a very, very long time. And it, it's only more recently that co-fermentation has become not the norm. Um, and we start using our standard single brewing yeast strains. Um, but it's important to understand your, your work and your yeast strains before we start doing it. So understand what you're working with. And if you've got any doubts, then feel free to give me an email, shoot me, shoot me a message. I'm, I'm happy to, to give advice and, and, and provide support. So, so please do get in touch. Uh, so that's just a, a short presentation. Um, and if you've got any con uh, questions or you want to chat through, um, please be my guest. That was great, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you very much. I have a question immediately. Go for it. Um, so, looking at um, sort of yeah, co-fermenting, co um, where would we find the information so that we can, you know, as you, 
you talked about knowing factors about the yeast, like you know viable cell count, and, that, and, they, and they vary for the yeast. Is that information published on the in the in the normal sort of fact sheets that that, that come with the yeast? It is on ours, yes. So if you go through the TDS, it will be on the TDS. Um, most of those parameters that I've spoken out will be there. Um, if there's anything you're not sure about, obviously get in contact. But uh, things like viable cell concentration should, should be on the TDS. What's the, the most important thing for consideration to, to look at when you, when you want to combine two yeast? So you say it, above all, this is the thing you should, you should look um, it, it does depend on what you're trying to achieve, but I would actually say that viable cell concentration would probably be my, you know, it's the most technical uh, thing that people probably wouldn't consider and could have quite, uh, you know, obvious effects if you were to get it wrong. So, you know, if, for instance, the wind mm. strain, you know, sometimes the viable cell concentration can be 10 times that of New England. So you can end up with a real mismatch there. Um, so that would be something that I would definitely consider. Um, before I started doing those confermentations. Uh, and then probably after that, I would look at the sequential inoculation. You know, if you've got a strain that you know is particularly slow versus one that's particularly virulent, I would look at that next and see, you know, should I add this at the start and then should I add another later? When you're doing that, do you, so you pitch one yeast first, should you pitch that yeast um, bearing in mind cell count wise that you're going to be pitching another one so that you don't over pitch uh, yes. I mean, although it's probably better to be on the safe side is probably what it's, I would say, you know, it, you don't want to have too many cells. So if you take your first kind of pitch, you probably want that to be about half your viable cells or maybe slightly more if you want to get more of the flavor from that yeast. Uh, and then you want to add the, uh, the second one at, at a later point, probably try again, have 50% at that point. Um, but it's better to have more than less. Uh, and actually the negative effects associated with over pitching are, are quite small compared with the negative effects of under pitching. So I'd always err on the side of caution. Yeah, and I, right. I guess you don't want to stress the, the first yeast out by, by using only half, because um, then you end up, you, I guess you're going to end up with a bit of a mess of fermentation, even if, you, even if you're pitching the second lot three days later, for example. Yeah, it shouldn't stress it out too much at that point because it's got all those nutrients and those sugars available. It's more at the point of halfway through fermentation when it started to, to exhaust all the simple sugars and it starts having to use nutrients to produce more enzymes that will become a problem. Um, so at the start, it shouldn't be too bad, but certainly when you add the next one in, you want to have enough yeast for the whole fermentation. Okay, that's good to say. Thank you. Andrew, just linked to that then. So if you oxygenate the first, the work to begin with, and then you get a lot of growth with the first yeast. How, how do you do that with the second? Do you just pitch a lot more because there's no oxygen there? So if you're using dried yeast, it doesn't matter because um, the dried yeast is producing that aerobic environment. Uh, if you're using wet yeast, again, that's a bit more of a challenge, yeah. So you could add a little bit of oxygen, um, but you wouldn't want to do that too late in fermentation. Um, mm -hmm. The oxygen will be taken up by the strain very quickly, so actually the chance of damage is quite low, um, but you wouldn't want to do it too late. So use, dry, use your dried yeast? Absolutely, for everything. <laughs> well, well so, since we're on, on that, if you're pitching a wet yeast from a starter that was uh, grown in an uh, aerobic environment, then surely oxygenation is not that much of a problem? Yeah, I mean, if that's the um, instruction of the yeast, I, I would agree, yeah. If it's been grown in an aerobic environment and it's not coming from a slurry, then it should be okay. I was going to ask about um, you talking about using Nottingham as a co-yeast for, for lager production, um, which is quite interesting because I'd heard about somebody before uh, brewing an a, a award-winning Hellas just using Nottingham at a cold temperature. Um, and it, if you were just sort of related to that, I mean, if you were, you probably need more yeast uh, for, for, or would you need, first of all, more yeast at that lower temperature with Nottingham? Uh, yes, you would. Yeah. So you'd probably be talking about using Nottingham, but pitching it at a more of a lager rate, if you know what I mean. Um, so it's much higher kind of number of viable cells per mil. Um, and that's just because the metabolic rate of the yeast at that temperature will be much lower. Um, but it is cold tolerant and it will continue to ferment at that temperature. And so, yeah, I, gonna... I would up the concentration. 
it, I was going to ask, sort of related to that, then if you're needing more yeast, I, I would sort of think about maybe brewing sort of light ale first of all with it and then using that yeast from that as your lager yeast. Um, if you sort of your, your first fermentation was at a, at a normal ale temperature, is that going to affect the ability to ferment at lower temperature if you, if you reuse that yeast? It shouldn't do neither. It should adapt to it relatively, relatively easily. Um, the only thing is if your first fermentation is a slightly kind of uh, tricky environment for it, it might struggle. But I, I don't think in the case of just doing a, like a, a light ale, it wouldn't really be a problem. Uh, Philip and it's I actually from, remarkably fast. It can yeah, Philip and I used Nottingham um, to ferment um, um, a stout at 12C. And we, we used two packets for, you know, your standard five gallon batch. And that finished exactly where we wanted it to finish and uh, produced exactly the flavors it would, we wanted it to produce. But it was actually a very nice and viscous beer, even though it didn't finish too high. Um, so, um, yeah, just an extra packet did the job. And that was a 12C for 13 weeks, not 13 weeks, three weeks. Did it take three weeks to ferment out of interest? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it, it was um, at, at the brewery where we left our kit. So, you know, uh, when we came in th you know, three weeks later, it, it was already done. Not sure when exactly it finished. I've had great results with using Nottingham to save fermentation. So I've had a few where um, the fermenter coolings failed and it just kicked in and it's dropped the temperature of the fermentation down to maybe like, you know, 12. Uh, and you pitch Nottingham and you seal it up and you give it a couple of days and it just creeps back up again towards like a 17 and kicks off. It can, it can be a real lifesaver. It is one we try and uh, convince commercial brewers to just have on the shelf as kind of a get me out of trouble yeast. James, couldn't you use Nottingham and pressure for men to get the same effect? Well, it depends upon whether you've got a pressure, uh, pressure capable fermenter. <clears throat> uh, corny cake. True, true, yeah. No, I was just sort of thinking randomly about it and uh, whether the, the sort of difference between the initial fermentation and then reusing these for another fermentation was had any difference if the if the temp if the, the conditions weren't exactly the same. Pressure wise, it, it it's quite pressure tolerant, but it, it doesn't like too much. Uh, as with any yeast, you can you can go too much on the pressure. So um, as your pressure increases your uh, level of dissolved carbon dioxide in solution increases um, and quite a lot of the reactions that yeast use to grow are decarboxylation reactions so they require um, a lower level of CO2 in solution to be able to grow so you can actually go too high on that CO2 and actually prevent your yeast from fermenting properly um, so pressure is good up to a point. What, what, what is that point? Is there a general? Uh, not really no <laughs> unfortunately but uh, to be honest, most of your pressure fermentations, if you're just going to the pressure required to carbonate, it's not going to be an issue. But I do know of people that will just seal up things and go to crazy high pressures, and that won't work very well. The main reason that I've only just started pressure fermenting is because I haven't got um, a good, reliable temperature control to ferment lagers at... Uh, at uh, low temperatures and pressure fermenting has really turned out. I'm really been quite pleased um, with it. So that's the main reason I, I do it. But if I, for example, wanted to produce an ale, obviously if I was to pressure ferment um, with an ale yeast, it will knock back the esters. Do you do it, uh, an ale yeast which might be tolerant to, to pressure and we could use and still retain some of those um, esters um, at the end of it? There's nothing that we produce that's specifically produced for its high pressure tolerance. Um, what I'd say is, it, you know, if, if you've had luck with it fermenting under that pressure, it's not likely to be a problem. It'll be, it's until it, you know, it's not a problem until it is a problem. Um, and then, because that's the, the same reason you get less esters is because you're getting less yeast growth, right? So if you increase that pressure to a point at which the yeast growth stops, then you don't less esters because the yeast isn't growing, but also <clears> you don't <throat> ferment properly. Um, so, you know, I think any aromatic yeast would probably do. Um, just don't go too high. Um, what, what kind of pressure are you talking? Uh, 12 to 15 PSI for lagers. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that would be too much of an issue, but I wouldn't go much beyond that. 
Paul, when I've done ales, uh, even with the USO5, start and especially hoppy pale ales, I kind of start it off at like three or something, just so that it emulates a drop of a couple of degrees centigrade, um, so that the esters get produced still. Um, but you, yeah, you don't you don't stop it producing esters if you get up to sort of 12 or 15 PSI, like a nice clean lager would ferment under pressure. Um, but yeah, you might kill off the AL esters. So I just start them really low at three until it's almost done and then maybe transfer it at three into the corny keg and then carbonate it after that. One of the benefits, one of the benefits of pressure fermentation is is the time it takes. So and the two lagers that I've done have been done and dusted within four days in terms of the, the fermentation. That wouldn't be the same if you're fermenting um, at say three psi, would it, Steve? It'd still take quite a lot longer. Um, it should be the same because it's not the pressure that speeds it up; it's the temperature that speeds up the lager fermentation specifically. Yeah. So ale should, okay. yeah. at 18 degrees, should finish at a normal ale timeline, really, within a week, maybe. Yeah. But you do get the pressure fermentation advantage of keeping the oxygen out and the hops in and the malt. Yeah. So yeah, just do three or four PSI, maybe. Give that a go, yeah. Can I add one about um, producing a house strain, maybe? And um, obviously, you've kind of recommended here, kind of don't repitch um, because you don't necessarily know how the other uh, blend has changed over time. But if you wanted to kind of go down the route of, say, doing kind of a Windsor Nottingham combination and then repitching for, you know, four or five or 50 brews, you know, what would be the pitfalls that would you know, arise and how would you work around them? Um, so, on, on the commercial scale, particularly if you're using Nottingham Windsor, you'd probably worry about um, the Windsor uh, getting slowly bumped out of the culture over time because you're basically selecting for something that's quite flocculent that comes off the bottom of the fermenter. Um, and it may be that you get like a small trace amount of Windsor that just kind of continues to be within the culture over time as well. So you can end up with a house culture that gives you like a little bit of Windsor flavor over time. Um, but that would be the main thing I'd worry about is the, the drift in flavor. So you might start with quite an interesting fruity uh, fermentation, but then over time that's going to dissipate as that Windsor drops and drops in the population. Um, obviously, I don't know, taking something from the commercial scale where you can pitch something over and over again, um, and you can probably guarantee sterility and you can acid wash the yeast if you need to. And then uh, taking that to the, the homebrew scale is, is a bit trickier um, and probably less practical. It's probably something you're not likely to do so much. Um, you're not going to have those continuous fermentations going. Um, so I think the, the concerns there are different, but certainly at the, at the commercial scale, you'd probably worry about it just losing that interesting flavor over time. Um, Homebrew wise, I, I, if you're going to be reusing it, you're probably not going to reuse it for more than two or three generations. Um, so it might be less of a concern um, at, at that kind of scale. Yeah, okay. I mean, I suppose I, I think I just basically tend to repitch my Reese. I tend to kind of just do like a brew over kind of two weeks and then almost kind of take the slurry out, give it a bit of a rinse, and then repitch it and into the next brew the same day. Um, so it just kind of keeps on rolling and rolling as long as you've got kind of keg capacity to store the beer you're producing. Um, but yeah, so I think do you running... use yours continuously? You, how many generations do you go just continuous? Or... Yeah, pretty much. It's only if I kind of change yeah. style and need to go to kind of a, um, you know, like do a lager instead or do a, a stout or a porter that I'll, um, I'll kind of drop things off. But I tend to kind of use something like, um, like WLP07, just so I like a heavy flocculator that, that finishes quite dry. Um, but obviously with single strain, you're not getting any you know, complication around it, it's just really around yeast health. Um, but yeah, I think having a dual strain and just having, I think kind of the idea of having two different styles would be quite interesting just to see what it does to the flavour profile. Do you ever have problems with um, bacterial infection or anything like that? It's quite impressive that you can do that many generations and not a struggle. <sighs> not really that I've noticed, but 
Yeah, I, I, you know, certainly no funky off flavours. Um, and it tends to attenuate very well as well. You know, I've never had a beer that kind of stops at 20. It always seems to go down to, you know, kind of, you know a, a final gravity of 10 points or so. But that's, they're not super strength. They're not kind of like, you know, starting at over 1100, like uh, some of the guys here uh, heroically doing. Might tend to do more kind of 50 to uh, 60 points starting. But yeah, it's, it's certainly, you know, kind of, I think, and all I really do is just kind of scoop it out the bottom of the, uh, the fermenter and then, um, Chuck it in the fridge really for a couple of days if necessary. There's no magic to it. As long as you're clean, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to do it. But I'm just quite impressed. I'm sure if I did it. Just it lucky. Be... Touch wood. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other question I have is actually was just thinking about kind of, yeah, you know, if you think about when you're kind of pitching a dry yeast, um, obviously it goes to that kind of initial phase of kind of just, um, I forget the, kind of the term for it, but kind of the first 20 hours bedding in and um before we actually start yeah getting in a crowds and appearing um and so if you were kind of doing a mix of two would you look to try and pitch everything in the first kind of 24 hours or would you wait until there was like high crowds and then put your second yeast in depending on the ratio you're targeting or is there I'd a probably, point where it's too late uh well yeah there is a point where it's too late but i'd probably aim for kind of midway through fermentation kind of high crowds and sort of area um, and that's just because a lot of those esters are related to yeast growth. So if you've got the estuary strain there at the start and you've got that growth at the start, it gives you that, you know, the chance to get those esters out from that strain. So that's probably why I would do that. But yeah, don't, don't leave it till it's got into the mold to try or, or anything like that because then it'll just be really sluggish and slow to finish. Awesome. Thank you. Andrew, um, I'd like to ask you for a recommendation here. Um, one thing that I like to do with my home grow hops is make an IPA. And what I've tended to do is ferment one batch with like a hop forward West Coast US style yeast and another batch with an English style yeast so you get some of the fruity esters and things and then blend to, to taste. But I wonder if I was to just ferment it with with a dual strain, what, what would you recommend? Um, it depends what you're, you're looking for, really. So you're looking for it to be quite hoppy or not? Well, yeah, to have like the benefits of both, like the, to have like the, the real hop forwardness, but to have that, that, that character that you get from, from, the, from the English ale yeast that, you know, really lends itself to, to the sort of cask sort of end of the market. Yeah, I, I think a lot of those flavours, sometimes you can put down to biotransformation, which is the um, ability of some yeast to um, produce hop compounds, bound hop compounds from hops. Um, the verdant strain particularly produces an awful lot of those. Um, and it, it isn't a hop flavour, but it really accentuates it quite nicely. Mm. Um, so I'd probably look at using a strain like that. And they are the traditional Old English strains that produce that sort of flavour. So the verdant and the, the winds are particularly are quite good at doing that. So I'd either use them probably on their own to be honest and if you wanted to dial it back a little bit maybe use it in conjunction with the BRY 97 which is the uh, the American ale strain. Uh, and if I was to do something like that how how would how would I sort of think about pitching that would I would I pitch the, the English ale first and then do a sequential inoculation or pitch all, all those strains are um they're quite high in concentration so I'd probably do 50 50 um both at the start that's probably how I'd do it Okay, great, thanks. Andrew, did, did I understand right that if you had a pair of yeasts and pitched one early and it took off very fast um, and outcompeted the second yeast, if the first yeast wasn't a high attenuator, um, could you end up with an un you know, and it, and it over competed the first, the, the second yeast, could you end up with an un 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 under attenuated beer in that, in that? situation but the second yeast just never get going even if the second was a higher attenuator yeah it's, it's possible and in that case you'd probably see a beer that was very slow to finish rather than one that didn't finish at all unless it was a real mismatch yeah. um so you'd probably find that that one that is a higher attenuator would get there eventually but it would be quite slow and it wouldn't be very healthy and it would be a, a bit painful um you do occasionally see that in the trade where people have got a, a beer that's they think it's finished and they'll package it and it'll keep going slowly if it's got two yeast in it. So it's definitely something to be aware of. Um, 
if I was trying to increase attenuation, I'd probably always want to try and pitch on the high side with the, the one that attenuates to a higher level, just to ensure that you do get that fermentation. And do you risk diastole as well in that situation or, or just? Um, probably no more than in a regular fermentation. You can still do your diastole rest. So you can do a warm rest before you finish and that would probably clear it up so long as the cell concentration is high enough. Yeah, okay. Um, hi, I'll, I'll ask a question. Thanks, Andrew. Very fascinating stuff so far. Um, not necessarily to do with blending and possibly a question that many of the more experienced brewers here already know. But I'm just wondering, I've, I've had two, uh, you know, um, two different uh, sides of the story here about dry yeast. And uh, if I'm not making a starter, then rehydrating it or not before use. Uh, half the people I've asked have, are saying you definitely don't need to and half the packets say just tip it in half the packets. I know Lollamon says, you know, rehydrate it. So, you know, in your opinion, is it something that actually makes a difference? Is it something that you highly recommend? What do you think? Because for me, it feels like an opportunity for bacteria to get in. And so I'd rather just go straight from packet to fermenter in general. But I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, we've actually done quite a lot of work on this in recent years. And, and then it's a recommendation that, that comes from when we originally started producing uh, brewer's yeast and uh, maybe the production method wasn't quite as good as it is now. Um, and what you'll find is that um, if you do a rehydration, the difference between the rehydrated fermentation and the non-rehydrated fermentation is very, very small uh, to the point that it almost makes no difference. So I wouldn't discourage you from doing uh, a dry pitch if that's what you wanted to do. Um, the caveat being that in some scenarios, it is advantageous to rehydrate. And those scenarios are when you've got a very strong wort. So when you've got an awful lot of sugar uh, in there, that, that helps a lot. And if you've got a sour wort as well, anything that stresses the yeast cell wall, um, it's better if you um, rehydrate. Um, when you dry yeast, the wall actually forms like a crystalline structure. And when you rehydrate it, that crystalline structure is rehydrated and it goes back to in, into its fluid form. Um, and when you've got like a sour wort or a very strong wort, uh, you have quite a high osmotic pressure. So it's quite hard for the yeast to rehydrate. So it's important when you're doing stressful fermentations to do a rehydration step. But if you're just doing a standard uh, low gravity pale ale, I wouldn't necessarily need you needed to do it. What would you just, as, as the quick follow up, what would you say counts as like the high gravity kind of like sort of line? Probably going up towards like 60 or higher, I would say just yeah. it's probably advantageous to rehydrate. Um, cool. And then pH wise, if you're doing like a sour, you've done a kettle sour and you've got worse at pH three and a half, that I would do it for that as well. Great. Thank you so much. Just one more well, while we've got you. So freezing yeast, is it basically impossible for a home brewer or just a rubbish idea? Obviously, I don't have any liquid nitrogen hanging around. Yeah, I, I, mm, you, you probably, it will survive, but it probably won't be very happy. It would be my, my point. When you, when you freeze at low temperatures, you get ice crystals that will break cell walls and, and cell membranes. Um, whereas if we're doing slants for the, the Lama Contra collection, they'll be in deep freeze, they'll be liquid, liquid nitrogen. Um, so you, you can do it, um, but probably a cold fridge is just, just as good. Depending on how long you're keeping things for, obviously. But. Yeah, well, that's maybe the follow up question is, you know, how long would a, a yeast last in a, in a fridge? I always kind of think that after about four weeks, it's, uh, I get suspicious of uh, if it's just run out of energy, but. You know, I've heard other people kind of going for six months even in the fridge. Um, it, it would depend on how you're storing it. If you're storing it as a slurry, it's not likely to be in great health after four weeks. But if you're storing it on like a slant or a Petri dish or under oil or something, then it can last a very long time in the fridge. Um, probably six months is where you'd be looking. Um, but yeah, if you've just got a slurry, I, I wouldn't keep it too long. Um, the viability is going to drop fairly rapidly on that. You um, would definitely can't bring it back. Like, like I, I um, some yeasts I've kept for six, eight months as a literally like a bit of slurry and, 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 and the, uh, it's still in the work. Um, and yeah, then you, you, you make a start sometimes you need to make a second step, but um, I've not noticed any fermentation problems after that. Um, I have had yeast that literally ate themselves um, after a year 
Uh, but you know, you kind of you, op you open the jar up, you give it a sniff, and you decide what you want to do. Because if if something's gone bad, it smells bad, and if it smells nice and warty and beery, and I would do, do it, encourage you to sample the word off the top, um, then go for it. But always make a start. I, I would if agree. If you, yeah, sorry. If, if you've got yeast which is commercially produced wet yeast and, and it's still in its original package, you can you can you know grow that up again. I mean, I've just successfully revived a yeast that's been in my fridge for two years in a packet that, that was unopened. I, mean, I just created a very weak wort, 1020, just to see if it was going to do anything. And it did. So I thought, great. So that's still alive. So I've now suck it in another jar and put it back in the fridge for when I actually want to grow it up. Yeah, yeah I suppose I'm thinking about this kind of, yeah, I'm thinking about this kind of situations where if you go kind of brew like a lot of a standard beer, like an ordinary bitter or something, you reuse the yeast quite a lot. Then if you have kind of specialty brews like a, a stout or, you know, like an Irish red or something like that, which you don't tend to um, brew that often, you sometimes just want, to, just want to keep the yeast until the next time you do a batch of that, which may be six months down the line. Um, but yeah, probably I just shouldn't be stingy. Just buy more dry yeast. <laughs> Oh, wait, no, you know, today. No, buy whoever's yeast. <laughs> what keeps really well are, are mixed sour cultures. I have, I don't know, seven, eight in the fridge, and I use them maybe once every two years. And like they literally go out of our vial, no start into the beer, and absolutely fine. So, bread, bread is really, really hardy. Lacto, not so much, but bread doesn't care. The other thing you could do, Ed, is to uh, put your beer in bottles, a bottle conditioned beer, then you can reculture the yeast from the bottom of the bottle, which I've done uh, quite frequently several yeah. times. Yeah. yeah. Which I've never actually thought of that because, of course, you do it with the commercial brew, but I haven't thought about doing it with my, uh, my own home stuff. That's a good and shout. Then, and then you, you could taste the beer on the top. If the beer's okay, you know the yeast is going to be okay. Mm. Andrew, how, um, how in terms of how resilient, let's say something like Nottingham is, you know, when you want to rescue a brew that's been stuck, um, at what point, you know, if you're down to 1020 on a brew that started at 1060, let's say, um, at what point do you start to think uh, it's going to struggle to get going? Uh, you know, how, how, how resilient are you like that? I mean, if you've got to 1020 from 1060, it it's never going to be a quick fix, you know? Yeah. Um, so you can pitch the Nottingham at a high concentration and you can use yeast nutrient, but it's, it's likely going to be chewing through maltotriose, which is a, the three glucose sugar in brewer's work, and it isn't very f efficient at fermenting that. Um, so it, it's always going to take a bit of time. But if, if, you know, if there's enough sugar there and you can supplement the nutrients, it should be possible to get it going again. Um, it's not to say there aren't cases where it's it's a lost cause and it's not worth it, but um, most of the time you should be able to get a few more points out of it using Nottingham in that way. Okay. And, and so that's basically Andrew. That's what I'm going to do with my stuck fermentation. I've got the um, I've got the uh, Nottingham on the way from Amazon. Yeast nutrient is is a good idea to add. Is it too late? I'd probably add some in actually, yeah. It's um, it's the nitrogen requirement. So the yeast requires a nitrogen source to be able to grow, um, and at that point in your fermentation, that that kind of available nitrogen has been used up by the strain that was there at the start. Um, so if you can add a nutrient that contains uh, free amino nitrogen, that will kick it off. Um, so mo most yeast nutrients on the on the market should contain a, a reasonably large amount of of free amino nitrogen. It'd be, it'd be very rare to find one that doesn't. Um, so I would just use a kind of generic yeast nutrient um, that you can find on the market. Um, it'll, it'll probably mostly be made up of um, diammonium phosphate, which is like speed for yeast. So. Thanks. So I heard, uh, I heard a while back that some brewers um, put a teaspoon of yeast into the copper to, uh, you know, with the boil to get the nutrients out of it. Um, is that just complete nonsense or is there some fact in that? Oh, no, there's absolutely fact in that. It's, um, you know, it's quite commonly that commercial brewers will throw a bucket of yeast in the kettle. Um, if you think about a yeast nutrient, um, broad, 
spectrum yeast nutrient. Uh, yeast contains everything that a yeast needs to survive, much in the way that a human or a cow would contain everything that we need to survive. Um, it's got vitamins, it's got minerals. Um, the only thing it doesn't have is, is, is sugars. Um, and actually a lot of the broad spectrum yeast nutrients that Lalaran produces are produced from, from yeast. Um, so there's absolutely truth in that. Um, it's probably, you know, taking a teaspoon, it's not a very scientific way of doing it, but it would certainly provides some benefit. So you, so what you're saying is you basically have yeast cannibalizing other yeast, but would that make you be a vegan? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeast isn't meat, I suppose, and it's not. Oh, I know. <laughs> At what point, Andrew, if you've got a, a stuck fermentation, should you resort to like the uh, the sort of enzyme amyloglucosidine or AMG as it's as it's known? Uh, well, it depends what's causing your stock fermentation, right? So if your stock fermentation is because you mash too high or you use the yeast that doesn't ferment uh, longer chain sugars like mosaicos, then um, then you would re uh, resort to using an enzyme. But if your stuck fermentation is because you're doing uh, another pitch or you've um, not oxygenated enough, then that isn't going to help. In that case, you need more yeast nutrient and you need more yeast. Um, enzymes are a funny way that you probably ought to be quite um, aware of what you're buying because it probably will one of two different things. It'll either be an alpha amylase, in which case you'll probably see some drop in gravity, um, which might kind of finish your fermentation, so to speak. Um, but it may also be a amyloglucosidase, which is the same enzyme that saison strains produce. And if you were to add that in, then your fermentation isn't going to finish until it's done, effectively until that all that sugar has been broken down into simple sugar and fermented. Um, so be a bit careful with the enzymes that you choose. Um, but if you're using alpha amylase, you can add a bit in fermentation. But if you're using amyloglucosidase, just be aware that it's going to keep chugging on. Yeah, I, I used some once a long time ago, and um, yeah. I put in a very, very, about three grains of it, I think, from a packet, and it <laughs> took my beer down to below zero. <laughs> it's like not doing that again. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the problem. It will go down to like 0.998 and stuff. And yeah, not, not ideal. You could make it into distiller's wash. Get yourself a still. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, when I was working in a commercial brewery, that was the, oh, I, I've got a still. I used to take the first runnings off the lighter ton and I'd just shove in a mile of glucose days and probably like this much yeast in a 25 litre bucket and just let it rip. Um, and then I'll make vodka out of it. Works really well. <laughs> what did it taste like before you made the vodka? Like what was the actual, what's the finished beer in inverted commas? Oh, just a mess, you know, like really astery and horrible. And just, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a Scotch whiskey distillery and they, if they get you to taste the washbacks, it tastes like that. Really not very nice. Kind of if you took a, like a wheat beer and concentrated the banana flavor about 10 times, it's a bit like that. I'm not a whiskey drinker, but the, the term washbacks doesn't fill me with, um, I've not seen that on, you know, in advertising before. <laughs> it's, it's just what they call the fermenters. <laughs> Sounds too much like backwash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which isn't good either. There must be a reason they call it that. I'm not sure why. You, you can still taste that in the faint spirit as well. It, it does come through. Yeah, absolutely. It just, it just, it it just yeah. when it ages out, it disappears. Yeah. What's that? The banana, James? Yeah. Well, there's that that flavour of the wash in a, in a in a whiskey distillery is uh, is something else. It's yeah. If you smell like a not a peated whiskey, like a kind of a space side or something, you get you do get that flavour on it. It's quite obvious. So is that why they age whiskey for ages? Because they actually start with shit work. <laughs> well, that and a lot of the flavour comes from the wood, so yeah, yeah, you yeah. need to age it. <laughs> but still. <laughs>
if you read some of the distilling forums, what they call a fermentation would just make your eyebrows curl, I think. Like, <laughs> at the, you're like, oh, the terrible way to treat a yeast. <laughs> The, well, the, the, uh, the American distilling forums are the best where they're talking about using horse feed to start with. And then, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, really? Uh, that, which, yeah. Which begs the question. It with grain still in and you're like, oh, what? <laughs> not <laughs> with fermentation with the, like, not even like sparge yet. Ferment it with the grain still in there and you don't. <laughs> So if you did try to make whiskey out of actually decent, you know, nicely produced, healthy fermentation, uh, then wouldn't you sort of already begin with a superior product, flavor-wise? Oh, it's probably a bit more subjective than that because some of those flavors at lower concentrations in the spirit are quite beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. So you'd probably end up with a really boring whiskey, I think, if you did a really nice fermentation. That, that would be my thought on it. We, uh, we actually we have a whole distilling side to Lalaman. Um, the business has got quite a lot of different drinks divisions and we're all separate, but we've got uh, quite a lot of whiskey experts. So if, if anybody's really interested, I can, I can put questions to people. I, yeah, I'm, I'm in, like, even though I don't drink uh, spirits really at all, uh, I, I, would, I would be interested in, in, in the impact of the word fermentation onto, onto whiskey flavor 25 years down the line. Is that why and you're it, banned from Russia, Serge? Uh, Lee, there are many reasons why I'm banned from Russia. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're interested, pop into some of the Glasgow homebrewers uh, chats um, on Zoom, because I think just about every single member of Glasgow homebrew has got a still. Um, <laughs> so if you are interested, that's that's one avenue. I can ask and see if we've got any literature on it, because we probably do. Um, we actually produce a there's a book called the alcohol textbook which is produced by the um distilling division which is really technical so there's probably something in that back to beer andrew um what's the difference between your uh the verdant yeast and the new england uh yeast uh, yeah, they're actually quite different beasts. Um, so they produce uh, quite a different ester profile. Um, so they've got different kind of characters of fruity to them, but they also have quite a different um, biotransformation kind of effect. So there's, there's two different types of um, biotransformation, which are beta lyase and beta glucosidase. Um, and they produce different amounts. Let's see if I've got, I've got documents somewhere. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I need to find it. There it is. It's open on my laptop. Um, so the um, the New England is very high for beta glucosidase, but low for beta lyase. Um, whereas the verdant is very high for beta lyase and only medium for beta glucosidase. Um, so you need to take that into account when kind of deciding the differences. Um, but beta lyase is the one that produces um, kind of the almost like the the thiols, they're kind of quite, um, they're quite flavor active, but they're in quite low concentration. So your beta glucosidase are producing um, like linalool and stuff like your classic coffee flavors. And um, with the beta lyas is more kind of the flavors that you'd associated with um, kind of Nelson Southern kind of hops, that sort of flavor and kind of a black currenty type flavor. So it's, it's, they're quite different in the characters they produce, but part of it is the different levels of biotransformation that they, they take, uh, they, they, they do. Um, so yeah, they're quite different strains. They're also quite um, different in their viable cell concentration. So the New England strain is quite um, it's quite slow. You almost have to baby it through fermentation. Um, but the um, the verdant strain is the complete opposite. It's a monster it rip through. Um, so they they are quite different strains. You know, they've been produced um, with the idea of producing similar beer styles, but they are quite different in their fermentation characteristics. I've, I've won a lot of verdant yeast and I've been uh, fermenting it at 12 degrees and it still goes crazy for it. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's, it's kind of, it shares a quite a lot in common with the nothing as far as fermentation performance goes. Right. Flavor-wise, it's completely different, but it, it, it kind of, it doesn't surprise me that it goes down that far. Um, it's rumoured to be, a, I can't remember which strain, I think it's 
one of the old English um, kind of well-known strains. It's rumoured to be that. Uh, Boddington's, that's it. Um, whether it is or not, I couldn't confirm. Um, but that, that's the rumour, is it's an old Boddington strain. Um, and that's a very fruity um, beer, if you've ever had it. It's, it's a bit of yeah. a pale um, imitation of what it used to be. But occasionally, if you go to a ship hotel, you can get it on draft. Um, mm. <laughs> Needs a good diastole rest, I've found. Can you do it uh, after the pines have been poured? What did you say, Serge? No, can you do a diastole rest after the pines been poured? Because um, I've read on our Slack that it, it's it's for diastole. Uh, you know when you get into the glass. I haven't tried it myself. Put it in your pocket for a bit. That'll warm it up, and then. <laughs> Nobody started doing ALDC at the homebrew level yet, unfortunately. Andrew, if I if I wanted to make um, uh, use a lager strain at a higher fermentation temperature, what what um, which particular Lanamond yeast would I use? We we actually only have one lager strain, and that, that's the Diamond yeast. Um, so I'd, I'd probably use that one. But if you wanted to use or produce a lager style beer at at a, at a higher temperature, you maybe be better off using a either the Nottingham or the cold strains, they'll be a bit more um, subtle at that temperature. The lager strain will be a little bit estuary by the time you get it up to a really high ale temperature. Yeah. Um, whereas, whereas the Kolsch produces quite a nice flavour. Um, it's it's similar to New England in that it needs to be babied through fermentation. So just like be aware of that. Um, it likes a high pitch rate and it prefers slightly warmer temperatures. Um, but I, I'd probably recommend either either that or the Nottingham if you're wanting it to be a bit more of a kind of clean fermentation. Um, you can use the lager at the, at the higher temperatures, but it will be quite estuary. Mm. So would you would you prepare a starter then to, to uh, you talk about baby? Uh, you could <clears throat> yeah you could prepare a starter or you could use more of the dry. So one one of those two, um, and then just make sure that it's actually ripping through, and if it's not, can. Uh, I mean, maybe increase the temperature up a little bit but yeah the, the strains like the Kolsch and the New England are just naturally quite slow and you just need to keep an eye on them um, make sure that there's a lot of a lot of cells in there at the start of fermentation actually David that reminds me of a, uh, a really good question um, well for me anyway um, I've got caught a, a couple of times where I've only had one sachet of dry and um, it wasn't enough for the beer and I felt too guilty to go around to Marie with my cap in hand again <laughs> and ask for um, more yeast. And, uh, and, um, and so I made a starter, but, but I really haven't. And I've, I, I, did a, I did a bit of looking, I can't remember on cell counts and everything or whatever, but I, I think I put it in, I can't remember, a couple of liters maybe, this is one sachet, but I really didn't know what I was doing at that point. What would be your recommendation if you were trying to grow up as you know a sachet we actually we've got a, a, a best practice procedure for that so i can send it through to you if you like um off the top of my head i, I can't remember it's been a long time since i propped up yeast in the lab uh, but i think we used to do um into 10 so we do like if we were doing a, a starter we'd start with kind of one into 10 and then we do 10 into 100 like, like that so probably step it up that way but we, we do have a we've got a document somewhere so i can send it to you i'd be interested just because i i couldn't really find that much information about you know theoretically or you know practically the ideal size of starter that you dump a uh, you know a sachet into yeah I'd be interesting I'll, I'll i'll look it up for you now i'll send it across Marie, are you still there or are you uh, in the middle of dinner? I can see you on the chat. She's hiding. There we go. Oh, no, I'm here. <laughs> I just didn't want to, uh, uh, to, to disturb uh, Andrew and uh, he's so much, uh, I mean, he, he speaks better English than me at first. <laughs> and he's probably worried he can... that you can outshine him. <laughs> so he can bet it answers the questions and uh, uh, yeah, but about your question, I think uh, on the lab, yes, they go from one to ten, and it's uh, like if you want to make uh, your yeast growing, but it's uh, 
Oh, so yeah, I had, uh, I had my video. And, uh, but yes, yes, no, 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 no worry. I mean, uh, you are my best, um, my best experimental uh, friend uh, at Chamonix. I can, uh, I, I, I have always some yeast uh, not far for you. <laughs> Certainly the one who bludges the most. Um, I, ho I hope you can, you can, you, you, you may try the Philly so, so may, did you want it to test it? Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't tried the Philly yet. I'm, I'm, I made a very bad goes of last year and so I'm determined to do a better yeah. version of Philly Sour. Um, nice. Now, the only reason I asked if you were still here is I just wondered if you had any questions for the group here about uh, yeast nutrition, because I know that was something we were asking about before, just about how it was used and whatever, and there's quite a varied group of brewers here, um, so. Yeah, no, this is a, um, but that was a very interesting to listen to all of you because it's, uh, yes, nutrition had been a, a good topic. Um, among Allemands recently, I mean, uh, uh, we have many solutions for commercial brewers. That's true that for home brewing, uh, uh, we mostly have the zinc addition with the servomyces. And uh, uh, listen to all of you. Uh, I, I, under, I really see that here that uh, you, you are aware of the importance of nutrition. And this is one of our topic now also uh, to work um, a lot of, on that. So. Hopefully, we'll continue all together, you with your interest, us with our research, um, to have a good solution, yes, uh, for nutrition. Because uh, uh, Andrew spoke a lot about viability, but uh, uh, actually, uh, we have also to, to speak about uh, vitality. Uh, we have always this example of two people running together, but uh, they all are viable, but if they are not all vital, uh, they will not finish the, the waste at the same time. So vita vitality is, is uh, thanks to the nutrient. And uh, about zinc, it seems that uh, all work uh, are lacking of zinc, so it's not never bad to add some. So maybe you can try some if you if you if you are a volunteer to try some uh, cerebiases and to make some comparison. Will be nice to hear your feedback after. I'm sure there'd be willing participants for that experiment. <laughs> yep, we yes. usually have people willing for to do pretty much anything as long as to do it. There. Good. Yeah, we can. Uh, it's true that uh, if you are, it's good to have this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, good meeting with. Uh, uh, many people very advanced in home brewing, so you can really uh, experiment stuff. Uh, and especially if you repeat the yeast, maybe it's uh, because maybe the results will not be so obvious at the same uh, at the first pitch. But uh, if you repeat two, three times, you may see more uh, uh, like uh, what we are aiming to is to have a shorter lag phase and also a better attenuation. So if uh, after a few pitch, after a few uh, three pitch, you see you still see uh, uh, um, good attenuation, whereas you don't see when you don't use nutrient, that will be thanks to the nutrient you use at the first uh, at the first pitch. But I'm sure Andrew uh, could uh, could uh, advise you some. Uh, some uh, about it, like, uh, like, like, like they do in uh, commercial boy. I mean, uh, it's the same, but uh, doing at the home boy scale. I mean, uh, yeah, no, nothing, uh, no, nothing, uh, nothing else. I mean, so on the uh, on the nutrient, I think at the start you mentioned the 11 plus competition. Is that like a crazy imperial stack? Yeah, um, um, every beer had to be um, brewed that... to be above 1100 uh, gravity mm. points. Because that's one where the servomyces would be very beneficial because the zinc stabilizes the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. So it'd be, it'd be really useful for that sort of thing. Um, did you use any? Nope. But I did, uh, but I did co, co, um, co pitch two strains for, for my Imperial Stout that took. Uh, at first in the category. Um, I actually co-pitched, I think, for all the beers that I've entered until, until 11 plus, uh, two placed. 
Sorry, Andrew, I missed that. Did 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 you use any what? Sorry for the. Uh, Servomyces or, or a, a nutrient containing zinc um, or Servomyces because um, for high alcohol it's quite important to have um, high levels of zinc within the wort. You obviously you will have a bit in the wort, but most brewers' wort is quite deficient in zinc, so it can be quite beneficial. Well, you know what? Let, let me open up the recipes and just just tell you for sure if I did use because I would have made a note. Um, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yep, yep. There is 10 grams of yeast nutrients uh, in each of them. I uh, don't know why I did it. I probably thought it was a good idea. Didn't know <laughs> what I was doing, but apparently it worked. Um, so can can you get zinc um, out of the standard uh, brewing ingredients or, or seven mices is basically your only route? Uh, no, it depends on the nutrients. So there's, there are nutrients out there that contain uh, zinc. In the case of Servomyces, it's a yeast that contains zinc. So mm -hmm. it's the yeast that's grown in very high zinc concentration. Um, it, and, it, you know, it, one of the reasons it was originally produced is because it can be used in Rheinhaus Kabut brewing because you're adding yeast to the fermentation. Um, and you're also adding zinc at the same time. Um, but no, you can, you can obviously get nutrients that just contain zinc sulfate as well, which is um, if you weren't using uh, Servomyces, that's probably what the nutrient would contain. But but if you don't use nutrients, is there a brewing ingredient like you know like malt for for example that could provide that for you, or does it just simply not have enough? No matter. It what just it yeah, it doesn't have enough, so you'd need to supplement it with a a, a zinc source. Okay. So how you know throw in half of your previous yeast cake into the boil, possibly one solution. I'm, I'm asking more. Uh, there'd be some it. zinc in that. It, yeah, there'd be some zinc in that. It might not be enough to, to um, give you enough for the, the high alcohol fermentation. Um, but it possibly... depends on uh, what part of the yeast you want for the... I mean, when we when we produce Servomyces, we use not... Uh, I'm not sure we use uh, all the... All the... Um, all the yeast of... Uh, all the part of the yeast Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Servomyces, I think it's, yes, dead yeast that uh, we, we went through uh, process. So we, uh, what we really want, what we are really targeting is the zinc. But we have some other product uh, like a yeast left over when we have some, uh, it's, uh, it's not an extract, but it's part of the yeast. I mean, you have the membranes, you have inside, and uh, we are we are targeting some some of the parts who are the white if we want nitrogen, if we want zinc. This is very uh Devomyces is just for zinc. This is uh, quite simpler. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that, that, that's, that's good to know, thank you. But of course, uh, if you need some uh, some other uh, if you need nitrogen, that we have some other uh, nutrients. Uh, uh, but it's uh, yeah, 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 no, it's, yeah. I think there's there's maybe two questions for me there. So one is um, I'm just looking at the the data sheet for Servomyces. I I hadn't actually heard of it before, um, so it looks very interesting. But I see it kind of it notes that you should add it um, to the kettle ten minutes before the end of the boil. Um, and so I always thought that kind of vitamins were something that you didn't want to expose to high temperature because they denature or or change or so on. So is it is it generally okay to add nutrition, you know, yeast nutrient generally into the boil? Um, and then probably a second question is, you know, aside from zinc, are there any kind of other top nutrients we should be thinking about, kind of magnesium, calcium, any kind of usual suspects that we should be thinking about? We actually, I do um, need to make a, a second uh, talk. I was going to say, we, we actually <laughs> we, we did a, a webinar recently on yeast nutrition, um, which I think is still available. So I, I'd recommend digging it out and watching it because it, it goes into all of that sort of stuff. Um, on the, the kettle edition, I, I, most of these yeast nutrients aren't um, provided sterile. Um, so it's a good idea to put them in hot side because if you put them in cold side, you might end up with um, problems. Um, and in the case of zinc, you're talking elemental zinc. So there's not going to be a problem with putting it in the kettle. I think it's also because of the blister, so the, the zinc, the Servomyces for home brewers, so the, the, the small uh, capsule, uh, it's a live yeast inside. Whereas for commercial boys, we are, it's dead yeast. Mm 
So as it's lab yeast inside the, the Seromyces, you don't want them to work. So that's why we are recommending to boil them. Sense. Is it not that, Andrew? Andrew is frozen. <laughs> so, so um, you know, a, a decent, uh, you know, let's call it, you know, decent, not, not just, um, you know, uh, one, one aspect, but a de decent yeast nutrient would contain uh, a, a, a good amount of, of zinc. So um, what is the benefit of using servomyces over a, a standard yeast nutrient that you can get in a homebrew shop? That, that's not like all in brand that contains only one compound but actually has a mix. Is there any benefit? And you know, where would you use either or? I don't, uh, I don't know. Would you, oh, sorry. Hey, am, I, am I still here? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me? No. Yeah. 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 I mean, you. you In the case of correcting specifically a zinc uh, deficiency, then you would look at using servomyces, or you might use it in the case that you were using a yeast nutrient that didn't uh, contain uh, zinc. Um, yeast nutrients themselves, you can actually go into quite a lot of detail in yeast nutrients um, as to how some are more beneficial than the other, but on the very cheap side of things, you probably have uh, yeast nutrients that just contain diammonium phosphate and not much else. And in the case of that, what you probably see is massive yeast growth um, which will then deplete the nutrients available in the wort. So it actually could give you a problem uh, because it'll actually deplete your nutrients. So you actually end up with a nutrition problem because you've added yeast nutrient. Um, so you need to be adding something that is, is a bit more broad spectrum than that. So you can easily find a, a yeast nutrient that has a blend of either um, DAP and organic nitrogen plus vitamins and minerals. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably the best thing to use. Um, we have one called Yeast Life Extra or Yeast Life O, which is... Um, entirely organic doesn't contain any DAP um, but you probably you know you, you kind of need to be aware of, of what's in the yeast nutrient that you, you're using um, it, it can be as simple as just buying yeast nutrient but in that case you're probably going to end up with um, diammonium phosphate and you, you probably will see large amounts of yeast growth but you might not necessarily see um, healthy fermentation. That is um, actually a brilliant piece of advice thank you. Can I just really naively chuck in like a multivitamin and then my beer is a health drink then in a way? <laughs> sure, use Morocco because then it'll be a nice colour too. <laughs> <laughs> Effervescent, lovely. <laughs> it's hypertonic. You, uh... Yeah, it solves any carbonation problems. Yeah, multi recovery <laughs> beverage. <laughs> the fish you hang over you know. and it recovers you. I'd imagine the nutrients that, are, that exist within Barocca are probably quite good for yeast too. Um, not sure what it does your beer flavour, but it, it probably <laughs> gives some of the nutrients. <laughs> it's got the hangover cure combined in it. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah. Always hair of the dog IPA, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought somebody should keg Barocca and serve it at beer festivals on day two. I think you know. <laughs> And beer merchants did the uh, the sour beer thing. They had like little um, like antacids and stuff with like donations to charity. I uh, thought so that was a good idea. <laughs> Get your heartburn medication in early. <laughs> well, um, I, I think we're onto something because you know if if you if you make like hot water, hot tea with Barocca, you basically have a flavorsome recovery drink. I am um, going to have to say good night. I'm afraid I'm, uh, I'm getting called by the wife. So there's some dinner ready. Oh well, thank you ever so much, yeah. Andrew. Yeah, yeah thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Andrew. Really good. Thanks, uh, Thanks a lot. Andrew. That's quite all right. No, no problem. I enjoyed it, and you know, hopefully, I'll be able to come to a meeting in person at some point soon. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. Fingers crossed. Uh, do you have a, sometimes you have um, you see all each other or you meet some somewhere also? Yeah, normally um, once a month in um, London. Oh, uh, good. Yeah, um, normally it would be tonight somewhere in Bermondsey. Um, but yeah, COVID. 
Yes, yes. Yeah, they, they, but, they're not going to do that anymore, Marie. They're just going to stick with Zoom from now on. <laughs> in, uh, you know, but, they, they, they real life is the way forward. The plan is to have regular Zoom meets even, even after we can meet in person because like just having you guys on to do a talk like this, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, there's no bind of someone having to get to our meeting in London and travel God knows where to back wherever they came from. And yeah, it's, it's really cool. And, and you can drink, you can drink and uh, drive, um, you don't need to drive after, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. If you drink and drive after a Zoom meeting, then that's a conscious choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've only got to crawl like about 10 metres. <laughs> it's good. No, but it's good to see that you are, all of you are really, uh, it's uh, this kind of meeting, you are all able to speak also very respectful uh, from others uh, to have everybody uh, asking questions and uh, yeah, very... Uh, very, very, very uh, useful meeting. Maybe also, yes, for all of you, yes. To at least say something good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I may leave you also as well. It's a, it's a bit late okay. also. Cool. And uh, hope uh, to see you uh, in the wheel very soon. Yeah, so we'll have to get, you over, get yeah. you over to London, Marie. Yes, yes. I'll be in touch. Cheers, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.